Let's hear a big applause for Mikhailo Joksimovic, who is with us remotely, I guess. The talk is also pre-recorded, but there will be the opportunity to ask questions later and we will have a conference with him. So, yeah, once again, a big applause, please. Alrighty, so doing machine learning in uh, PHP 8. Before we jump into it, uh, I'd just like to, to give you a brief, brief info on uh, who I am, uh, why am I showing you this, and most importantly, wh why am I not with you with you here today, which, which I'm, I'm really sorry for, but, but I have an excuse which I hope will be valid. So basically on the left-hand side, you can see what, uh, what, I, what, what actually is, who I really am, and on the right-hand side, you can see like what I'm aiming to be. And this, this is basically a bottle of wine, which was a gift from my girlfriend, because I kept telling her that, that this was something that I always wanted to, to put on Twitter, you know, like father, husband, author, speaker. And uh, at the time when she bought me this bottle uh, or printed, whatever, I was just a boyfriend and uh, kind of a speaker. So, so I had some speaking engagements, you know, and I'm actually happy to report that, that since then, uh, I've become a father, uh, became a husband and author. Depends if you if you count blogging, but uh, speaking of fatherhood, the reason why why uh, I'm not with you today, which as I said, I'm I'm extremely sorry about, is this is this little kiddo. Uh, <laughs> basically, this this little boss decided to 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 take management of of my time into his hands, and basically he decided that. I won't be I won't be joining you, which again, as I said, I'm I'm quite sorry about. Now, another reason why I'm showing you a picture of my baby is that um, well, it has something to do with machine learning. And what you may or may not know is that most of machine learning actually boils down to pattern recognition. You know, like you specify some input and you try to match it to some to some output and you know make some prediction or classify the data or whatever now what's what's extremely funny extremely interesting is that uh, one of the most interesting uh, pattern matching machines are actually humans and specifically babies so i observed my 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 sm small son like uh, my newborn baby and like when he's hungry, everything is a everything is a tit, you know. Like he's trying to suck on everything. Basically, he sees tit in everything that's shaped like a tit, which which pretty much just shows you the 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 the, the pattern recognition at at its best, you know. Like and uh, one of the most funny instances was was when he actually tried sucking on, tried sucking on my my wife's nose, <laughs> like she thought it was a tit. So that just tells you that even humans and even evolution is fallible. So don't get yourself stressed out if you can't get your model to, to be super, super, super precise, because even humans are, are pretty much, pretty much fallible. Now, what's actually quite funny about machine learning is that uh, you can really get a long way in machine learning career without having any clue what you're doing because there are so many great libraries including the one that i'm going to show you today and they make the stuff so easy that if you have the actual data you can achieve a lot without having any idea what you're doing you know which which is good and bad i guess so the the the, the biggest pro the, the biggest problem is actually collecting the data and and vectorizing it as we will see but anyway speaking of patterns actually you know, I mean, we expect computers to, to be quite good at this artifi artificial intelligence, but I mean, we consider ourselves to be, you know, quite intelligent, but even we have, have problems sometimes recognizing stuff, right? I mean, it probably takes you like, what, a couple of seconds to actually recognize that there is a dog and and uh, and a horse on this picture. And don't even get me started with, with this this image where you need to distinguish between puppies and, and fried chicken, right? I mean, even you as a human would have issues and imagine like how tough it can be for a computer, right? Now, most of machine learning, pretty much boils down to 
as I said, pattern recognition, you know, like, like putting some data on input, which we will see and, you know, getting some, some, something recognized or matched to or predicted as, as an output. Now, when I, when I kind of engrossed myself, like when I, when I put myself on this journey on trying to figure out like what's wrong with PHP and why is PHP not used that much, I was actually pleasantly surprised to, to learn that there's literally nothing that prevents PHP from being, you know, like machine learning first language and for, for, for being used for, for machine learning. And the only thing that actually is missing in PHP is actually the ecosystem. Like languages like Python or uh, Java or R have, have a lot of libraries, have a huge ecosystem, a lot of people developing them. PHP doesn't have that for, for some reason. And, and th that seems to be the only thing that PHP doesn't have. Everything else is there. And, uh, but on the other hand, luckily PHP has two amazing libraries. And honestly, I, I'm kind of inclined to say that they're maybe even, even better than, than Python versions. But, um, the, the one that we will be talking about today is Rubik XML, which is I'm, I'm honored to say that it's, it's one of the most fascinating libraries, one of the most easy to use libraries that I've ever encountered for, for machine learning. And the second one is PHP ML, which is interesting to, you can Google it and check it out, uh, but, but it's not as powerful as Rubik's ML. Rubik's ML is like a fully complete, amazing solution. <coughs> Sorry. Now, basically we will be talking about Rubik's ML today. Uh, but before we start, uh, if, if some of you probably saw it, that, that I, I created a poll on Twitter and I actually asked like how many of you are, uh, how many of you, how familiar, how many of you are, how, how much familiar, so to say with, uh, with machine learning. And the, 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 the outcome of the poll was that, uh, most of you are, you know, like, like have some basic knowledge of machine learning, but, but not not some advanced. So I'd like to give you a brief overview of, you know, how it actually works under the hood. And the reason why I want to do that is because I think like, once you understand how, how easy it is, I mean, in a nutshell, uh, and, and once you understand the principles, you can actually build like some amazing stuff, stuff on top of like really basic principles, you know, and to, to, to enable you in, in that, in that pursuit, I'd like to introduce you to basic building blocks. The most important thing in, in, uh, in machine learning, uh, and that thing is called vectors. Now you might have heard of them. Uh, they, I think they are taught in high school or, uh, like late elementary school. I'm not sure. But, uh, basically depending on who, who, whom you ask, uh, if you ask physics students, uh, vectors are pretty much like the arrows pointing in space, which have length and direction. So, so that's like a physics student, uh, description. Now, if you ask like a computer science student, uh, and which is basically something that is also valid for us, vectors are ordered list of numbers. And this is pretty much what we will be focusing on, like vectors as focused list of numbers. Now. I just like to share one amazing quote that, that I saw, uh, which says the introduction of numbers as, as coordinates is an act of violence because deep down math is just beautiful and vectors are, are just beautiful. And, um, uh, at the end of this lecture, I will give you some, some, uh, some, some information on where, where you can learn more and how, and I would actually encourage you to do so now back to vectors. So. As I said, the vectors are pretty much just ordered list of numbers. And you can say that vectors have dimensions, you know, and, uh, if you're talking about like a one dimensional vector, that would be something like this, like vector a with just one di dimension two. And if we wanted to plot it graphically, it would be, you know, like, like a straight line, like one axis and, uh, yeah, number two, right now, if we want to talk about a vector with two dimensions, you know, like we would need two axes, right? Like, uh, th this is vector a with coordinates two and two, right? And this would be another vector, like with coordinates four and one. Now, why am I talking about this? The reason I'm talking about vectors is because everything in machine learning boils down to having 
well, like requiring you pretty much to define your input vectors. Like your data for doing anything in machine learning has to be like vectors. Some people call them, I don't know, rows. Some people call them whatever samples, I don't know. But in essence of it, the data used for machine learning are vectors, you know, with, with dimensions. Now, one beautiful thing about a math and, uh, well, about a math is that, uh, it, it doesn't care how, how many dimensions you have, as, as you will see, like, like you can, you can have like thousand dimensions, like whatever. But, um, the main question in machine learning is usually like, how can you compare if, if two vectors are the similar, right? Imagine if A was like a Kentucky Fried Chicken and B was a puppy. Like, how would you say if B is like a puppy uh, or if, if B is a Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? And one of the beautiful ways to do that is actually to measure the angle between between vectors, you know, like like the smaller the angle, the, 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 the higher the chance that vectors are actually the same, you know, pointing in the same direction, having same coordinates and stuff like that. Now, I just like to, 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 to point out that as I said, like you can have many, many dimensions, but you can, we can per perceive, we can, we can graphically show just three dimensions because like we humans can only work in three dimensions. We can see three dimensions, but mathematically speaking, you can have like infinite number of dimensions. And again, mathematically speaking, you can compare the angle between like n dimensional vectors, which is again, the essence of, of what machine learning is now. To give you a concrete example, because this, this might have been like uh, too abstract. If you ever, if you ever opened any course on, uh, on machine learning, you might have encountered this Iris data set. So Iris is just a flower species, spe flower species. And there are actually three, well, three different categories of this, uh, Iris flowers. One is Iris setosa, another one versicolor. And third one is Virginica. Now I really hope I got the, 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 the pronunciation, right? Uh, I apologize if, if I didn't, but somebody was comparing them. Somebody was collecting data and somebody realized that what differentiates these species, the, these, these types of iris flowers is actually their petal and sepal length, right? And somebody actually was quite nice to create a table with some data, you know, like for example, and this is actually what what I'm, uh, what I'm, what, what I was talking about. So basically what you have here is actually a vector with one, two, three, four dimensions. And basically we are saying that this observation with this dimension is of the family Setosa. And this one is also of this family Setosa. This, another one has different dimensions and this is vesicular, right? And some people call these columns, they call them features. I call them dimensions, honestly, but feature, feature, like this is one feature. This is another feature. Feature is the, the most common name to be honest, but what they are in general, these are vectors. Like this is, this is like vector one with one, two, three, four dimensions and the label, another vector, you know, vector number 50, whatever, like each row is actually a vector. And another thing that, that I'd like to, I'd like to introduce is the concept of a data set. Data set is quite universal name for, uh, for, for how you represent your data. And basically this is exactly the name that is used in almost every machine learning library, including Rubik's ML. So this grouped data of vectors of, or samples, like depends, like if you're from statistics background, or if you're coming from mathematic, mathematical background, basically these groups of samples or vectors or whatever are called data set. I hope you won't mind me enjoying some, some nice wine. Now, anyway, so, uh, speaking of Rubik's ML, Rubik's ML has really amazingly easy way to load the, the data, you know, and pretty much like, like with two lines, we can actually like load the data set, get the data set object back and we can do some amazing stuff with it. Now, again, as a reminder, as I told you, like, how do you actually, let, let's say that we want to basically classify based on the input data, we want to classify, predict the label, right? So how do you do that? Well, what I told you is the way to compare, the way to compare two vectors or, or two, two, um, two samples 
one way to do that is to compare the angle between them. And one of the easy ways to, to compare the angle is called cosine similarity. Some of you might have heard of it. I'm sure that, that I think it was probably taught in a, in a high school or whatever. But cosine similarity pretty much says like how, measure the similarity of two vectors uh, by measuring the angle, co cosine of the angle between them. And the formula is actually quite simple. It might look a bit, it might look a bit scary initially, but but trust me, it's simple. So so let's say we have two vectors, for example, like uh, you know, like this is one flower and this is this is another flower. Uh, if we input the data above, it's actually quite simple. And this says that these two vectors, the similarity between them is quite high. So, so the higher the higher the number and ma maximum number is actually one and the uh, minimum number is zero. So pretty much like, like one means that we are talking about the exact same vectors and uh, the lower the number actually, uh, the, the, the basically the, the lower the number, the the less similar or more different the vectors are so now we have like, like now we have a way to actually compare vectors to compare if two flowers are the same and that, that th this is actually a basic building block of something called like uh, classifying and uh, pretty much a lot of stuff in in ml now there are some other distance metrics like Euclidean distance, Manhattan, whatever. And if you open Rubik's ML documentation, you can actually see that there is like a bunch of distance metrics. So I told you that that this Rubik's ML library is quite powerful, and uh, you can see see its power here. Now uh, back to the back to the back to the our example. So we have our data set and. As I said, these are our vectors. So how do you actually determine? How do you actually determine based on this? Based on these like uh, features, like these dimensions. Like imagine this being vector A with 5.1, 3.5, 1.4, whatever. How do you determine actually to which class it belongs? You can measure the the, the cosine, and uh, but th there is a better way, and that better way is actually called k nearest neighbors all right so k nearest neighbors is pretty much it, it's an amazing way actually and uh, it boils down to measuring the cosine like measuring the cosine between your vector like imagine we plotted this is the vector that you're predicting then th this is like one group of vectors this is another group of vectors so pretty much you say like i want to find three nearest neighbors like i want to find the vectors that have the three vectors with most similar cosine to my vector and based on that i will categorize it right so in this case we have these two here and one is like, like two blue one orange and basically this means that uh, our sample is actually classified like blue you know so so th this is this is one super easy example of how you can actually classify anything. How you can see to which to which group something something belongs, which is a process that again you might have heard of it. It's called classifying. And K N N or K nearest neighbors are one of the one of the most simple and yet like like pretty powerful ways to classify anything, right? And um, how do you do that in Rubik's ML? That it's actually really amazingly easy, as 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 you can see here. So you instantiate the estimator. So Rubik's ML has this concept of estimators, which is pretty much the the, the algorithms that estimate something. You say that, well, for example, we can we can look for five five neighbors. Like we are looking for five vectors around our vector to, in order to classify it, and we call the train on a data set. Training is pretty much just guessing the best values and, and finding some best values as, as we'll see. Now, uh, why I spoke about cosine and others, because what you can pass to, to pretty much any classifier are the distance metrics that, that, that you want to use. So Euclidean distance is used by default in K nearest neighbors, but you can use cosine, you can use Manhattan, Minkowski, whatever, all right? And uh, as I said, it all boils down to pretty much, you know, like uh, instanti instantiating some existing 
samples and training your estimator on the data set. Now the question becomes like, what is training, right? And uh, I'll have to refresh myself a bit. Now, what is training? Well, training a model is actually determining good values from all the weights and biases from, from labeled examples, right? And this, this is like, um, this is the standard definition, which pretty much means like you take the input values and you try to match them to, to, uh, to, to some labels. Now, from my point of view, uh, I would actually say that there is a way better definition. And I would say that training is all about making a guess, like making a best guess, evaluating how wrong you are and repeating the process until you are not that wrong anymore. Right. So, um, up. So, so. In this case, we, we basically, uh, we train our data set by taking, like we take a full data set and we remove 10 samples that we will use for verifying. Okay. So, so you, you want to, to verify, uh, your results against something, right? So you make your test set and basically we train our model on the data set, which right, right now contains uh, minus 10, like total number minus 10 uh, rows. And after that, we make the predictions and the predictions are pretty much you input the dimensions and you get back the, uh, you get back the, the, you get back the predictions. And how this actually looks like is basically, this would be the, the test set. Like these are the values that we input and the, the values based on which we want to predict the values. And given these inputs, our, our estimator, uh, yeah. And they're called features and, uh, based on these, based on these inputs, our estimator pretty much, um, tries to guess the, the actual class, right? Now, as I said, training data is all about making guess, evaluating how wrong you are and repeating the process, right? So. What you actually want to do is, and what I want to do is to introduce a concept of a metric and metric is, uh, pretty much like, uh, evaluating how wrong your predictions are. And what you want to do is you want to minimize the error. You want to, to maximize the, the correctness, right? And one really simple way of, uh, checking how, how correct you are is dividing like number of correct guesses with the number of total samples, right? It's, it's like super simple, super simple way. Now, uh, aside from that, there are some other ac accuracy metrics like mean squared error, like root mean squared, squared error, F beta, and basically Rubik's ML has you, has you quite covered when it comes to, to metrics. Uh, again, I'm just amazingly fascinated by, by what Rubik's ML offers now. What we have been talking about so far is, I, I think I mentioned it a couple of times, but this is called classification. And, uh, the formal definition is that classification re refers to predictive modeling problem where you actually want to predict a label of something given the input, right now with iris data set and with, with, uh, a and B vectors with two dimensions that that maybe doesn't, doesn't really show you the full power of, of what we are talking about. So in order to give you a better, uh, in order to give you a better idea of, uh, of what classification of, of, of some real life classification examples, I'll show you something different, which you might have seen. So, um, here is a great example of classification. Like given the handwritten digits, try to recognize what the digit is, right? That that's believe it or not, that's actual classification. So you get like, like, I don't know, 800 pixels or whatever on the input. And based on that, you, you want to classify, like you, you want to classify the input as a digit. This is a classical classification problem. Another classification problem would be like trying to figure out, is it a, is it a chicken or a puppy? Right? That, that's, that's classification one-on-one. Uh, another thing would be like trying to classify similar articles, right? Like trying to, to classify, uh, like which articles are the same or different or whatever, or 
another example that that you might have not thought of would be like if you could if you could turn your logs like your web logs your http logs into into uh into like vectors you could you could actually like classify what's 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 an attack like what's a suspicious attempt and what's a what's like um banning like like what's a how to say like a proper request and what would be like like a security breach attempt you know so all of these are really in the nutshell classification problems and the reason why i spent so much time talking about classification is that so many things that that you might encounter if you if you uh like jump onto the ship of learning more so many things actually boil down to pure classification and pure comparison of factors the only question is like how do you compare them and how good you are in converting your stuff into vectors um for example one use case would be like recommender systems believe it or not like similar items and stuff that that's classification one on one now another thing that um, classification is usually referred to as supervised learning because you know like you have your data and you have your labels like, like you're supervising the learning there is another concept called clustering and this is really really an interesting concept as well and clustering is an unsupervised method which basically says that you have the data but but you have no idea like uh you have no idea how to segment the data, how to classify the data. You know, like imagine just just having a bunch of unstructured, unstructured uh, articles or or pages or whatever, and having no idea uh, how to structure them. But you, for example, you know that you want to structure them into three groups. So Wikipedia has this amazing uh, amazing GIF of where where you say like. When you get the data, so, so these are all the samples, like with two dimensions, and you say you want to cluster them into three different categories, uh, and in the best possible way, right? So clustering algorithms are all about actually finding the best way to split your data into number of groups that you want to specify. Now, uh, by itself, that that may not tell you much, but uh, let me let me show you some actual uh applications of of clustering uh spam filters uh market segmentation for for example like you, you could actually try to, to to take your visitors and try to cluster them try to segment them into into like two or three groups like you have no idea which groups there are but you want to segment them somehow right uh, you could identify fraudulent activities you know like basically Th th there is just numerous number of things that you can actually explore by trying to cluster your data, seeing like like which clusters did you get, and uh, basically exploring the further the clusters. And Rubik's Rubik's ML has you has you covered there. Like it has quite some quite some clusters available, so uh, you can play with them. It again it all boils down to exact same concept. Like get your data set, instantiate the class, train it, and get the data back. Now, we've spoke about uh, classifiers and clustering, uh, classification, and clustering. The the usually the, the third, they usually say there are like three different things that you can do. You can classify, you can cluster, and the third thing is regression. And regression is quite cool actually. Regression is pretty much investigating the the the. Um, the relationship between the variables and and basically predicting predicting something based on that. And let me give you one really simple example. Let's say that um, let's say that you have some data on like uh, like how on heights of people and you want and their weights and basically you want to 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 find the ideal weights, right? So these are like these are some heights and weights. And one really easy way of predicting light, like for for your height, what would be the ideal weight is called the, the linear regression, actually. So you might have heard of it. The linear regression is extremely simple 
way of predicting data, like predicting, for example, let's say if you have a person like, like who is of this height, what should they weight? What should their ideal weight be? Well, you, you put a, like uh, you put an ortho, ortho, uh, orthogonal. Like I can't even spell it properly. You measure the distance between your height and this linear regression line, and uh, you get the the, the weight. And uh, th this could sound simple, but it is simple in a nutshell because the idea is the idea the whole idea of linear regression and the idea on which a lot of regressors build on is that you want to find a line that perfectly goes that perfectly mimics the 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 the, the shape of your data you know and this this line seems to be perfectly splitting the data in half you know and basically it's all about finding this alpha and beta coefficients and before you get scared of them the alpha is actually like like how high like like how high you are from the from the zero point and beta is is the slope of your line and th this is really like linear regression is amazingly powerful like, like you can make all kinds of of predictions like given i don't know given the uh, you, you can put like like number of dimensions like like given the 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 the, the day of the week and and then previous previous days visits how many visits do we expect today you know stuff like that that that's linear regression and stuff like that and um rubik xml again has you covered and there is like uh there is a bunch of regressors available but again regression is all about predicting the value based on some input data quite an easy concept really simple to understand but it has a lot of stuff that it can build on and a lot of predictions that uh, that 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 you can you can make like for example like what would be the next year's revenue well you you input like some data like previous year's revenue like number of new users whatever like, like you put as many features as possible and you're trying to find a line that that perfectly depicts the previous data and based on that line you predict the future data and uh, yeah, again, it's it's really powerful and a lot of stuff builds on that. Now, next question, next logical question is, how do you actually apply anything of this in, in NEOS CMS, like, right? Well, um, you just just by Googling, like applying machine learning in, in content management systems, you can get a bunch, bunch of ideas. But uh, one use case could be uh, finding and classifying similar pages, for example. Like uh, another one would be suggesting design ideas. If if you ever used uh, PowerPoint, you might have seen that there is design ideas, which actually, in a nutshell, is just a classifier, believe it or not. Like uh, it vectorizes your inputs and tries to match something that uh, that's most similar to your page. So, for example, suggesting design ideas for uh, for your page. Or maybe you can uh, you can embark yourself on uh, building a recommendation engine. Again, recommendation engines are pretty much like uh, I'll find users that are similar to myself, and myself is described as a vector that has some features, you know. And features could be like number of pages I visited, my interests, whatever, you know. Again, you you know the basics, so it should be easy to understand. And based on that, find similar users, like classify myself find similar users or even use clustering to, to try and explore a bit. So maybe you can build a recommendation engine or you can maybe work on uh, some plugin to to um, to analyze and predict um, user behaviors. And uh, yeah, quite quite some quite some um, quite some ideas that that you can really honestly honestly play with. Now uh final question like would be uh where to go next so what i hope what i hoped to to uh achieve with this presentation is to to give you a base to give you a base to understand what machine learning builds on like what are the basic concepts and the basic concepts are really about vectors and similarities between vectors and uh, about training your data and, and uh, finding the error. And 
to introduce you to RubikML. Uh, and honestly, one of the perfect destinations uh, if you are in a hurry, it would be just to go to rubixml.com, uh, open the documentation. It has incredible number of examples that pretty much build upon the 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 the, the building blocks that I uh, provided you with, and they have a lot of use cases. So you can maybe explore there. Uh, another cool resource is I, I know it's Python, but uh, it's it's a handbook, and that handbook actually exists online as well. It's a free version, so they say just like if you bought the book, you can follow this this website. This is a free web page. It has a lot of things that you can actually. I mean, it's in Python, but you can use it to get to get ideas of what you can do and how you can do it, and then apply it in in a PHP. So, so really, an amazing book and an amazing resource. Now, another thing is, if you want to go deeper into the essence of everything, uh, there there is just no resource like three blue, one brown. This guy goes into like the the essence of of vectors of linear algebra, and it's one of the how to put it like one of the most impressive and and the most interesting ways i've ever seen math being presented so if you have some time and if you have some curiosity absolutely go go and uh, check out the three blue one brown website and three blue one brown by the way is actually how, how the retina of of this guy looks like it's it's there there is a condition where th three fourths of his his eye are actually blue and one part is brown and if you also want to do some deep diving there is an amazing book that uh, i'm just rereading now it's called statistical modeling a fresh approach this is basically presenting statistics in in a complete new way like uh, not a boring handbook with bunch of i don't know tasks and uh whatever it's just like it takes real life examples and introduces the statistical concepts. So if you have time, uh, this book's th this book is like uh, an 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 amazing resource. And finally, uh, this time th this is about R, but th this web page actually introduces you to the concept of text mining and what you can do with text. And trust me, even though it's in R. Just by going to this page and and checking the examples, you can apply the same things in RubikML, and you can do amazing things, uh, amazing things with with your text data. So so absolutely absolutely go and give it a shot if you want to to learn more about text mining. And trust me, text mining is is all about text mining and all about text is actually how do you convert like unstructured data which is text how do you convert it into something structured how do you convert your text into vectors and now i hope i really hope that uh, you understand why i put so much emphasis on vectors and similarities between vectors and some basic concepts like k nearest neighbors uh, like clustering algorithm, algorithms and linear regression. The reason is that because everything, everything, everything builds on top of that. And once you understand those basics, you can do, do amazing stuff. So with that, I'd actually like to uh, thank you very much. I'm really deeply sorry that that I haven't been able to to, to be with you uh, today. I'm sure that the, the, the conference is amazing. Uh, I saw the speakers. The speakers were, were amazing. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much. I'm hoping to see you next year. And uh, you can find my blog here where I blog about everything from relationships to tech stuff. You can follow me on Twitter or add me on LinkedIn. And what I would really appreciate is if you go like to if you use this QR code, uh, it will open a link with uh, like 30 seconds form where you can rate myself. I would really appreciate if you if you take time to rate myself because uh, like <laughs> since I'm not with you today, I really have no idea if you like this, if you didn't like it, if it, if it if it was what you expected, if you expected something more or whatever. So you would do me a huge favor if you actually open this link and uh, rate myself.
And uh, yeah, with that, again, I'd like to thank you. Uh, I'll be available on, on chat for taking any questions. So I'll be available there and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. So uh, thank you very much. So also thank you, Michaelo. We have a live connection now. He can see us and hear us. Hey guys. Perfect. <laughs> I can see and hear you. Awesome. So do we have any questions via the app? Otherwise, I would have a question. Uh, that would first be awesome. off, first off, oh, we have three questions actually. So my question will have to wait. Uh, I'm reading them now. For what use cases have you used machine learning? Do you personally use PHP or Python uh, for your machine learning projects? Wow. So, so basically, I used I, I used it both for 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 university and for job purposes. On job, I, I actually did one amazing thing that, uh, that I maybe I failed to mention, but it, you could probably understand. So basically we, have a, we had a use case where we were having a lots of incidents, like, you know, like customer complaints and whatever. And that was a huge issue with trying to categorize them and stuff like that. So what I actually tried, and it actually worked quite nicely, is some basic text mining to actually like, you know, classify the text into like a couple of buckets, you know, and uh, it, it worked actually amazingly well, like based on the content of the content of the text, you could actually like see the, the you could like with really high accuracy, get the right, we call it a category or module team, whatever. So, so that, that really helped. We're using it like actively for two years now. Another thing that, that, I'm not doing it personally, but another team is. It's basically they're building like a recommendation engine, which is like how to put it for somebody who is not using it. So basically, it recommends you based on the stuff that you want to purchase as as a company. It recommends the best suppliers with some previous best experiences and whatever. And all of that builds up on these really simple use cases that uh, really simple basic basic things that, uh, that I told you about, like, like how you vectorize the, the stuff and basically how you train and, and, and classify things. Does that give you a, an answer or there is a, or is there a follow-up question? I think that was a pretty good answer to the question. Um, so we have another one. Uh, do you have any stats on performance, maybe in comparison to TensorFlow in Python? No, uh, sadly no. So, so Compared to TensorFlow, no, because I honestly didn't even try TensorFlow because I'm more like a vanilla guy, you know. So, so I tr like TensorFlow is, for me. It's like it's like too abstract and too nice and whatever. So so, so I, I don't have it. Sadly, no. Totally understandable. And the third question was: Are there any possibilities to do deep learning in Ruby, uh, Rubik's ML, and is there any GPU training application through NVIDIA drivers, for example? Now that's the part where I said like PHP eight because I mean even in PHP seven you can do I think you heard about like foreign function interface this new thingy this actually opens the door to basically using C level or whatever like C plus plus level functions that would that would utilize the GPU and stuff like that. Unfortunately, I don't know if it's I saw that that Rubik Samuel mentioned it like because. There is a huge incentive to do that, but I honestly don't really know if they implemented it yet or is it about to be implemented. But I'm pretty sure that in the future, there's just no way not to do it because you can do it. Like you can you can pass your calls down to like low level library that would that would utilize your GPU and you know like like PHP would be the rock star that it, that it's supposed to be from the day one if you ask me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, hopefully yes. <laughs> uh, there's even another question now. Uh, does um, I think that Ruby XML get DDoS with slow CPUs? The, the, what? Uh, does ML get tedious with slow CPUs? Does it, uh, uh, TDS? No, it says ML in the question. Uh, can, can I see machine the learning? I, I guess it, it, it's, it's an appreciation for machine learning. I think if it's a, if if it's tedious with slow CPUs, tedious with slow CPU. If if, if machine learning is a, is a problem on a slow CPU, if you have a computer with a slow CPU, are you 
do you, will you run into problems when when you're trying out machine learning? That's a very good question. Like, like let, let, let me think about it. Uh, so, so basically, most of machine learning is about like utilizing the ma matrices and li like multiplying matrices and whatever. So I would say that, I mean, if you have a slow GPU or no GPU, li like no external GPU and slow CPU, I would presume that, yeah, you would likely, I mean, depends on like what you're trying to do. If, if you're training like a small, like some small model or something for, for home purposes, probably not. But I would presume Okay, Mikhail, are you still there? Uh, you just froze on the screen. Typical Zoom moment right here. Ah, now you're back. So you you just we just lost you for a few seconds, but everything's okay. We we hear we heard the last few sentences. And now you're back. And uh, one last question that I would have, uh, do you have any recommendations to store your data sets or does it depend on the amount or what did you use, for example? No, to be honest, like, like at the end of the day, it's like whatever you can, you can do because like we, we, we use both CQ, we use CSV. I mean, I, I, I really think it, at the end of the day, it depends on where your data is. I mean, like, like some people are think. I think I'm literally pulling it from, from Kafka. I, I don't have any specific recommendation. I guess it depends on like where your data is right now. Just use it from there, I guess. So makes sense, yeah. We use it from CQ without any problems, honestly, you know. So my CQ specifically. So all right. So thanks a lot again, Mikhail, for your great uh, talk Pleasure. and for asking uh, for answering all our questions here. So another big round of applause for Mikhail, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would love to be there. Yeah. <laughs>